my name is Babak. I'm one of the three organizers behind Walk, Listen, Create. Uh, but at least one more uh, of the other organizers in the meeting. His name is Andrew Stuck. And because I can't see all the participants due to the platform I'm working on right now, I can't be totally sure whether the third person is also here. His name is Geert Vermeer. Um, and uh, Walk, Listen, Create is a platform for uh, walking artists and artist walkers. And one of the things that um, we organize is every September, we organize Soundwalk September, which is a kind of festival for soundwalks. Soundwalks are a type of artistic expression using audio and walking um, to, um, to create art. Now, this year, um, one of the uh, shortlisted winners of Soundwalk September is Ella Perry Davis with her work Homemakers, and she is today's guest. Um, so I'll hand over um, uh, the microphone, the virtual microphone to Ella in a, in a minute. Um, so, but as I said, uh, she is the facilitator of Homemakers, which she created as part of her PhD research, but she'll tell the details in a second, um, which is a collection of sound walks from migrant domestic workers in both the UK and in Lebanon. Um, she's also recently worked on research with Filipino migrants in the UK on the impact of COVID-19, um, where they investigated the question of how to share the perspective, their perspective through using the arts. And she's got a book upcoming, uh, which I think is going to be called uh, Intimate... Oh, can I say this? Hello? Um, working title, Intimate Inequalities, and we'll leave it at that, maybe. <laughs> okay. Uh, the work, can I say what it's going to be about? Um, it's about the it's about the project about the homemakers project. So I think um, I think it will be self-explanatory. Yeah. Okay, but well, okay. Then I'll get back to the meaning of intimate equalities uh, at some point during our chat uh, in a minute or after you're done presenting. What will happen is Ella will talk a little bit about her work, uh, and we also have present several members of the Alliance of Migrant Domestic Workers in Lebanon, uh, several of which were interviewed for LSP's homemakers. Um, and maybe they'll also say a few words uh, after Ella's mm, uh, introduction. Um, how will um, we operate or how we will we work during this uh, call, during this online meeting? As I said, Ella will present. Uh, some of the members of the Alliance might follow up with uh, a few insights of their own. Uh, and then really the floor is yours and ours. I'll have, uh, seriously, if it would be up to me, we could talk for five hours uh, about uh, today's subject. Um, so I will have plenty of questions waiting, but if you have any questions, please chime in and do ask them or remarks. Do bring them forward. Now, because of the platform, because of uh, how I'm using Zoom, I cannot see you raise a hand um, because I only see the current speaker. So if you want to but in, just raise your voice. Just jump in whenever you feel like it uh, and I'll shut up. Um, so um, with that, uh, I would like to hear from Ella. Okay, thanks Bavik for the introduction. Um, I'm gonna keep it quite brief, I think, because I'd really like to hand over to the members of the Alliance um, in Lebanon, the Alliance of Migrant Domestic Workers. Um, but to give you a bit of background, um, as Babek said, I'm, I've been facilitating the platform homemakersounds.org or homemakers. Um, and um, that consists of a collection of sound walks that are recorded and co-edited with migrant domestic workers in the UK and in Lebanon. Um, so the process would work by um, me inviting a migrant domestic worker to take me to a place that has a specific significance for them. Um, and those places range from um, Kensington Gardens in London, um, which was the site of a picnic um, that brought activists from different feminist um, domestic worker organisations together to um, a supermarket car park in Beirut where one um, worker escaped from abusive employers on the way home from the airport. Um, 
and um, we would record a conversation in that place, which is quite kind of unstructured. I'm not coming in with an ethnographic interview. It really just starts from the question, why are we here? Why did you bring me to this place? Why is it important for you? Um, and we'd record a conversation and then work together to edit it. Um, so as you, many of you will know, the process of sound editing is really slow. It's very, it's painstaking. Um, and the idea in doing that together is to create a, a space for domestic workers to make really kind of considered decisions about how they want to represent themselves. Because I think so much media coverage and academic work also on, on migrant domestic workers um, is very one-sided. It doesn't tell a range of stories. It paints people in a very similar light. And they don't often have a lot of choice about how they're represented. And so I wanted to kind of undo that a little bit in creating this platform. Um, so once the sound walk is uploaded onto the website, um, you or members of the public can download it. And the idea is that you go back to that place where we recorded it and kind of retrace the steps and listen to the sound walk. So it's a bit like um, if you could go for a walk with somebody who you've never met in a place which they have a completely different relationship to, this is what it might sound like. Um, but of course, that isn't always possible <laughs> in, the, in the, the kind of transnational um, way this is operating and obviously under kind of COVID restrictions. Um, and so all the sound walks are kind of accompanied with different creative prompts. So one of them is listen on an empty stomach or one of them is listen in isolation. And they kind of depend on the content of the sound walk. Um, so that's all I'll say now about the process of making the sound walks. Um, I want to play a little snippet of one of them, which was made by two women who I'm really um, honored to say are joining us, or at least one of them is here already. Um, I'll play the sound walk and then I'll hand over to them. Uh, my name is Rose. Uh, my name is uh, Sarah. Uh, we are here in Sodeco Square in Beirut. It's memorable for us and it's a place to, I think it's important for us. This is the place where uh, for two years now we assemble every uh, Labor Day, uh, May 1st, here at Sodeco Square. We go out for uh, Labor Day as a demonstration to, to let the government, uh, especially the uh, Ministry of Labor, to, to hear what we are really what's the reason why we are on the street, why we are sh ch chanting all this, and why we say all these things like abolish kapala system, sponsorship, uh, justice and protection for the migrant domestic workers, and, uh, and uh, include, us in uh, include us in the labor law, because uh, these are so important for us, or else we will remain invisible. Okay, so that was a snippet from the sound walk, One Day the Kafala System Will Change, which takes place in Sodico Square in Beirut, which was the site of a, a protest for migrant workers' rights. Um, Julia, if you are able to speak at the moment, do you want to maybe share something of what it was like to go back to that place and to make the sound walk there? It was very good. It was... Um emotional it's uh, it's remembrance for us for always um, the start of our uh, our fighting and uh, I, I can say it's emotional yeah. it's emotional perhaps we'll move to lena do you want to say anything about the process of making the sound walk and introduce maybe what you spoke about um, yes, uh, for me, the sound work that I did with you last year was, um, it was very nice and uh, it's like that um, I'm talking to, um, it's like that uh, I've been in the process that uh, what happened to me again on the first time that I ran away and what happened to me uh, for the past uh, how many years that I've been here in Lebanon, it's like that uh, when I did the when I did the sound walk, 
it's like that it's fresh again that I can uh, imagine and I can still feel exactly what happened to me that day. Mm. And what did you want to communicate to the people listening to the sound book? Um, I'm, I really want to encourage them to, to listen to all of what we are saying to this sound book and uh, listen carefully and to, you know, to feel, to feel also what we feel um, in the experience that we have here, especially the, the difficulties that we, that we face every time that we are facing abuse and uh, to these uh, people that, uh, yeah, I think. <laughs> yeah. Your sound walk talks, as you said about you escaping from an abusive employer. Maybe you yeah. could explain a bit about what, what it's like for migrant domestic workers in Lebanon and why people do need to escape because quite a lot of people end up running away from employers. Maybe you could tell us a bit about why that is, what it's like for you. Yeah. Um, honestly, if, if the migrant domestic workers will, will uh, if they will treat their migrant domestic workers in a good way, in a, in a, in a good way, I think migrant domestic workers will not run away. But for me, it's different because first time I was abused already. The first time I entered Lebanon, I already faced abuse. Like uh, uh, my employer hit me. The second time when I changed employer, it's the same time happen again. My employer beats me again. And the third time I was... Uh, I was deported because I was accused of stealing. So I stay, I stay in Philippines for months and then I come back again. And then the time that I come back, that was the time that I ran away because my employer who picks me up in the airport while in the car, she was telling me that my salary will be 150 and I don't have a day off. And my salary, I, I'm not allowed to use a telephone. And uh, there, there is three children and she just delivered her fourth baby. And just like weeks, she just delivered. So for me, it's too hard because the first time I enter Lebanon, my salary is already 150 that time. So if I will, if I will work again for 150, for what I, I come back, it's like that it's the same it's the same process and then no day off i'm not allowed to use my telephone so from there i ran away because i don't want to accept it but now i'm i'm okay although my my situation is better than the other but still i'm not happy to those to those migrant domestic workers who are facing abuse till now and lack up uh, especially now there is pandemic and the uh, employers will tell them you are not allowed to go out because they are afraid that their migrant domestic workers will bring a virus into their house. So some of the migrant domestic workers now, especially the live-ins, they are not allowed to go out, no day off for how many months because I know this from all of my friends here now that they cannot go out. So it's very terrible, the situation that all of this, the pandemic and, and you know, the kafala and everything, it's like in one time, um, migrant domestic workers are facing a lot of things, you know, happen to them that uh, I don't know how to explain, but uh, too much. Yeah. Lina, can you explain what is kafala? Uh, yeah, the kafala, the kafala system is the sponsorship system that you are, uh, you cannot work you cannot enter Lebanon without sponsor. So you have to be, you have to have, you have uh, to have a sponsorship so that you can work here in Lebanon. 
and be, and because of this uh, sponsorship uh, some some uh, sponsor they are treating their their migrant domestic workers like slaves because it's like that they own you that like 24 7 you have to work and no day off some some of the migrant domestic workers are no day off and yeah, and then if I understand the situation correctly, what very much ties into this is that uh, as a migrant domestic worker in Lebanon, uh, you have uh, a contract with your employer, but you cannot cancel the contract without the uh, agreement of your employer, correct? Maybe I'll just respond to that question because it's true that under the kafala system, migrant domestic workers in Lebanon are not able to cancel the contract without permission of the employer, which is why workers like Lena end up running away without their employer's consent and often leaving behind passports or other really important possessions and documents. Um, but I'd like to make the point there that the situation we have in the UK is actually not that different. It's one thing to point to the kafala system and say, yes, over there, things are really, really bad for domestic workers. But here, the, the, in 2012, the Conservative Party introduced um, a tied visa system, which is very much like it's almost the kafala in anything but name. So domestic worker activists that I've made sound walks with here in the UK tell similar stories of being exploited, underpaid, um, experiencing labor abuse. And not being able to um, to withdraw their labour, or by extension, effectively negotiate their rights, because they then endanger their immigration status, because they're not able to be in the UK without this tied visa, which links them to specific employers. So actually, the situation here is not that different. Right, but then, for my understanding, because maybe indeed uh, my understanding is uh, no, my understanding is not. Uh, good enough for sure. Um, but what you're describing uh, for the UK is uh, if you choose to leave, then you have to, your employer, you have to leave the country, right? And is that then also the situation, uh, the kafala system in Lebanon? If you want to leave, you have to leave the country, is that it? Um, it's a bit, yeah, I mean, if you want, if you leave your employer, then you become undocumented, yeah. And if you're caught, then you, you're deported and there are fines. So effectively. Right, okay. So it's almost exactly the same, indeed. Yeah. <laughs> okay, thanks. Um, now, Ella, if I may ask, if I may um, uh, yeah, ask, um, what you did with homemakers is an, is an example of using public engagement in research, right? Because you uh, built or you created homemakers as part of your PhD, if I'm correct. My postdoctoral, yeah, my postdoctoral. Postdoctor, yeah. Is that not the same? I'm sorry. No, post PhD project, yeah, postdoctoral. Oh God, it's even one more, one step up, one step <laughs> up from a PhD. Wow, <laughs> we, we should all be on our knees, right? No, um, I'm not doing <laughs> Virtually. Uh, okay, so but part of your research, um, um, yeah. And um, earlier on, like years ago, you wrote a piece where you um, um, uh, supported or promoted the use of uh, public engagement in research because it's historically something that is apparently not so much used, not so much deployed. Yeah, I think um, academics kind of are being increasingly asked to um, have what's known as impact or to engage general public in research. And there's some hostility to this amongst academics and often for good reason, I think, because it's very instrumentalized. You know, we're, we're kind of um, this demand is made of academics to have yeah, what's called an impact on society, which is very one way and it's quite an aggressive one. So, yeah. I think public engagement is one way of talking about it. Participation or collaboration is another. Um, the project that I'm doing now would not be possible without the, the collaboration of um, members of the Alliance among, among others who've worked on Soundwalks. So it's kind of, it's kind of public engagement from, from, from the very beginning. It's nothing without mm -hmm. um, and hopefully it also provides a platform to engage broader publics in what those domestic workers have to say. So it provides this kind of 
um, platform through the Soundwalks where they can share their perspectives, not just with an academic researcher, but with other people who might be interested in doing the Soundwalks, hopefully. <laughs> Yeah, what what maybe also um, ties into this is that um, one, uh, yeah, and for some people this is very obvious, of course. So maybe I'm preaching to the choir, but who knows, right? Because I can't see who's in this poll, so maybe I'm not preaching to the choir. But um, with these personal experiences uh, that tie into uh, uh, current situation, current current affairs that we all know about, we also can learn or can see that the, the personal interpretation of these situations is highly personal. There is no fixed narrative. All these narratives are individual. Um, and by highlighting these individual stories, we, we, we see as consumers that there is no uh, um, cast in stone story as to what happens in Lebanon or what happens when uh, they come to the, to the UK or what happens when they are employed in the UK. No, they're all individual stories. Yeah. Um, you also, um, uh, in an earlier, in the same earlier article, this is, uh, I think it was in The Guardian, where, uh, as I'm in, Ca in Brazil, I noticed that the word caipirinha was misspelled, and it's mentioned in the article. Um, okay. That hurt a little bit. Um, <laughs> it's five years old, so, you know, no one read, well, no, I read it. Um, but you also mentioned that uh, uh, with research, there is the possibility to learn from artists in doing your research. This project learns from artists in so many ways. I mean, as I'm again, yeah, preaching to the converted, but sound walk making um, is a very established genre of art, um, but much more rarely, I think, used in research. Um, and so um, it's the work that I'm doing is a form of kind of borrowing from an artistic genre in order to. Um, as a research method or methodology, you might say, so um, in order to conduct research about people's everyday lives. Um, and that's just to go back to the point you made earlier, I think what's interesting about sound what making, and maybe we could say this more broadly for artistic genres, is that it doesn't make the claim that research often does to telling the whole story. The artists and audiences often know that you know we're not we're not telling the whole story here, and that's really important in the film. So I'm not using them to try and make broad or kind of generalizing claims about domestic workers' experience. On the contrary, they're all very personal. They're very intimate. I think um, to be part of both to make and to listen to, um, and. And they don't even tell an individual story, let alone that of a whole population. And as collaborators know, because they spend hours and hours editing them with me, we reduce a maybe two hour conversation to 15 or 20 minutes. Um, and so it's all the process is really all about thinking about those those decisions. How do people want to represent themselves? It's much more about paying attention to form and representation as much artwork is than about making claims, kind of empirical claims, um, which researchers often seek to do. Yeah, one of the things that I was reminded of uh, when I listened to the uh, um, uh, uh, audio pieces in Homemakers is um, it's, it's very strongly, also because, the, as you said, the, uh, uh, those that were interviewed participated in the creation of the audio pieces. It very strongly reminded me of this tool that is sometimes used in um, um, uh, marginalized communities for them to allow them to tell their own story in uh, their own voice is photo voice, right? Maybe you are aware of it or maybe you're not. Uh, um, it's, it's basically, you know, you give someone a camera and with the camera, you ask them to tell their own story. Oh, okay. uh, and this is a technique that is, is sometimes used in, in, um, well, in marginalized communities to, to give them a voice. Right, because these things are then going to be discussed, they're going to be talked about, it's going to be published in a way, maybe there's going to be an exhibition. So this allows them to bring this, these individual, these, these intimately individual stories, it allows to bring them into a more public eye. And it makes these stories um, something that can be discussed by a broader public, right? Yeah. So it builds awareness. Uh, and what you did, I think, with Homemakers is photo voice, but it's with audio. Yeah, it does sound very similar. 
One thing that I would avoid is saying, in my case anyway, that I'm kind of, that, or that the project is giving a voice. Because migrant domestic workers, they have a voice and they're using it really loudly. You know, we can hear that from, <laughs> from Lena and the other, and Delphine and Julia and the other domestic worker activists who have joined us tonight, that they're using their voice. And this provides a specific platform to maybe kind of amplify it in, in a certain direction. Um, but it's what's been really inspiring about making the sound walks is um, is hearing about how loudly domestic worker activists are shouting about what needs to change. The kafala system being one of those things. I was just wondering if you'd seen the work that, done by the Refugee Tales. Yeah, I know Refugee Tales. Yeah, and it's I I just thought that there was a lot there, and it's about the walking. Um, I've walked with the refugee tales and you meeting people and the fact that they use authors to um, anonymize and protect. I, I just was a little bit, I was listening to people's voices and I was listening to people stepping up to the plate and speaking about their experiences. I just wondered how that protective element actually works because I know with refugee tales, you walk, you talk, but then they use authors to tell the stories, to protect yeah. uh, the people who are coming forward and talking about their experiences. And I just, it was just something that struck me that you've obviously got people who are very wanting to be very vocal, but they are putting themselves in a, in a, a little bit of a precarious position. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, there is a level of anonymization in the work that we do, which hopefully is there to protect people. Obviously, there are no images and people don't use their real names normally. Um, but there's a limit to how effective that is. Um, I don't know if maybe one of the members of the Alliance would be well placed to answer that question. What risk are you taking in expressing yourselves through a sound walk? Uh, because um, most of the migrant uh, domestic workers here in Lebanon, uh, it's a risk what we, we are doing with the, with this project with Ella, the Soundwalk. Uh, even though we are al almost every year that we are involved in demonstrations, we are also risking our lives because of the uh, general security issues that uh, we are forbidden to join in demonstrations. The migrant workers are forbidden to join or to say something or demand anything from the government or say something against the government. So uh, yeah, it is, it is a risk. And uh, we want to, why we risk our lives in, in this uh, sound walk? Because uh, we are, uh, we want that the, uh, to be able to raise our voices, not for our own, for uh, for just for our our ourselves, but but also for those uh, migrant workers uh, to unify the voices of women uh, of different nationalities, uh, to be able to uh, to talk or to uh, have a voice for those who are uh, cannot speak on on themselves. So. Uh, our uh, involvement in this demonstration is is in general for every migrant domestic worker so their voices will be heard uh, what are uh, uh, regarding uh, the migrant workers rights especially in when it comes to labor rights and women's rights uh, we don't have that here in Lebanon uh, there are many cases that we are uh, facing like uh, uh, abuse or uh, un, uh, racism and exploitations and uh, all this, uh, you know, many things that I can I can just uh, can't mention. <clears throat> and uh, no one, uh, the the abuser, <clears throat> doesn't uh, care about that. All they care is that they have workers. They don't care about uh, our work and. Uh, the vibe, the vibe, they are not, uh, they don't care about the violence uh, for the migrant workers that uh, what the migrant workers su uh, suffers uh, in the hands of the uh, abusive employers. So, uh, and also those who have no uh, 
uh, day off. Uh, we don't know uh, what is uh, happening behind closed doors. So who knows what's happening? And so that's why we are on the street every year and uh, make our voices heard. So this is the reason why we risk our lives. I think I uh, did I answer my, that question? Mia, Elspeth, did that answer your question? Uh, sort of, but I was sort of more thinking of it from your point of view. My point of view? Yes. How yeah. do you protect them? Yeah. Um, well, as I said, there's a kind of a level of anonymization, and there are also discussions, really important discussions that we have around consent um, and the terms of, of, you know, of what we're doing whether people choose to participate and how they choose to participate um, and there are different options so people can choose for um, their voice not to be heard and for an actor for example to say um, their words in a different voice which is a little bit more similar to what refugee Pearls does though I know that's more of a slightly, slightly different um, set up there but nobody's taken that choice so far um, and I think that tells you a lot about people as Teresa said taking the risk to speak in their own voice nobody has taken up that option of having somebody else speak for them um, and that I suppose has been quite a message to me about the way that people want to participate um, in this project at least. Can you maybe broaden this uh, question of Elsbeth in a or can you can you look at this in a broader sense in the in the context of the term the name that you use for your upcoming book and describe what the term means, intimate uh, inequalities? Yeah, um, <clears throat> so intimate inequalities, yeah, is the kind of working title of the book that I'm, that I'm currently writing about the process of making the home, homemakers handbook and, and what I've learned from them. Um, <clears throat> and so intimate inequalities is central to the book because it's one of the conditions of migrant domestic work. Um, it's a very intimate relationship. Migrant and domestic workers often live with their employers and they can do for decades. Um, and yet it's also a very unequal relationship. Um, and <clears throat> in economic terms, it has to be for it to be sustainable in, in, a, in a kind of capitalist labor um, system. So that's one of the conditions of migrant domestic work, but I think it's also a condition of performance to a certain extent that there is always inequality in the room in any theatrical performance kind of encounter, but it is also very intimate and performance and many of the multiple artistic genres make a claim to intimacy um, and the sound walks certainly do. Um, and also ethnography, I think there's a, a claim to intimacy that ethnographers make um, and yet we also have to recognize the kind of economic and cultural and, and institutional disparities that ethnographers have. And maybe that's what you're kind of pointing to, Baba, is that it's really important to look at um, the inequalities between me and the people that I'm working with and to recognize their um, processes of choice and decision making about how they want to participate bearing in mind that inequality to never kind of lose sight of the fact that that encounter doesn't take place on equal terms and needs to kind of make as much space as possible I suppose for, for people to choose how they want to participate. Is that yeah, I, I think that's yeah, yeah I think uh, you uh, hit the nail on the head uh, exactly uh, I was driving at indeed that within research uh, I mean, you research, but uh, in a much broader sense, and specifically in uh, when um, like development agencies, uh, as we discussed in a previous talk that we had uh, earlier this week, in a development context, when you have a development agency providing a service to uh, a marginalized community in the global south, the the connect the, the relationship between these two parties is very intimate, but it's also very in unequal, right? And it's very difficult to manage it in such a way that there is a, a certain kind of balance between um, the agent in the agency between these two different parties. But one of the ways I think that you address this in your in how you um, um, realize the work homemakers is that you create the, the, the resulting work with 
the people that you interview. It is not you who interprets their uh, yeah. contribution. It is actually the people that you interview who um, uh, interpret their own contribution. They decide how to present themselves. So they, yeah. they have agency over their own image. Yeah, and I think it's worth saying as well that, um, you know, to come back to that, that question of giving a voice, um, and also to, to the question of kind of people conceptualizing their participation or choosing how to participate in ways that I really hadn't foreseen. Some people spend, some people I work with have spent kind of 13 hours editing with me, sitting down side by side at a computer and doing the editing and learning the software and doing it themselves. Others were just not interested. They were just not interested to do the editing. It was more important. The conversation that we'd had um, was more important to them. And one of the sound walks is called, because I know somebody who is listening, that's a quotation from the sound walk itself. Um, and it's, it's by and about um, a 55 year old lesbian domestic worker in Beirut who is a guitarist and um, plays the guitar in her church band, but the church is um, actively homophobic. Um, and it's really all about how she kind of negotiates her sexuality and her faith with her desire to play the guitar. Um, and that sound walk was really, it was really intimate to record and she had zero interest in doing the editing because for her to know somebody was listening in that moment of um, just having the conversation one day after church on her birthday, coincidentally, was really more important than this kind of idea of giving a voice in a, in a broader public sense. She wasn't really interested to do the editing and to know that it was on a website and to think about all the people who might be listening. It was just that encounter that was important. Whereas for, as Teresa has expressed and, um, and others did in the process, for activists, it's really important to have that platform. So it kind of really, really varied between, between people. And that this is, these are things I hadn't always foreseen in devising the kind of the process and it's about leaving really it up to people to choose how they want to be part of it. Yeah, thanks. I'm Gerry O'Neill, I'm in Ireland at the moment. It's just fascinating to listen to all of this. Actually, I, my, my, my question was really one about ethics as well. It was coming to Elspeth kind of articulated it much more eloquently than I could have put it so and, and I think it's been kind of addressed so I think it is it is interesting I think for people interested in kind of I suppose research or work that's socially kind of interested in social justice how you how you balance the um, yeah, participation of voices with the kind of uh, the ethics of not exposing people to further exploitation by their participation in the work, I suppose. Uh, I don't have a, it's, I'm not saying that's the, what's going on here. I'm just saying it's a line that has to be kind of really delicately um, worked, but I think, but I think the answer is often, one, one solution is often in kind of artistic modes of representation and, and art can, can mask and anonymize and you know, layers of subjectivities where we can hold on to the the, the sound of, of the, the quality of a voice, but but um, but maybe the, the individual, the specifics of the individual can 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 uh, be protected, I suppose. But anyway, I, as I say, else, but then it's been discussed anyway. Sorry, just a comment on that. I think yeah, what you're saying about kind of layering subjectivities is is super interesting and something I'm possibly going to explore in another project. But um, yeah, I think one of the other things that you could think of as a form of protection that I didn't immediately because it's not one of those like institutional ethics kind of risk assessment type things, but is the fact that the interviews or the conversations are completely, they're not really structured. So as I said, I would ask, why did you bring me to this place? But then it's really up to that person to decide what they want to talk about. And sometimes they don't want to talk about domestic work at all or migration they want to tell me about their relationship with their parents or their children or some, something else you know or playing guitar or whatever so there's no pressure on people to talk about exploitation or to tell distressing stories or to um to make demands as active there's no pressure on people to do any of those things as far as i can control it um 
although again there's always you know there's always that inequality between a researcher and a participant and we have to be mindful of that but as far as I can I've devised the project so that it's really open-ended and people don't yeah they don't have to tell distressing stories they don't have to talk about exploitation it's not expected of them at all Ella, you um, told me that uh, you started uh, working on homemakers uh, with a theater-based workshop. Can you say a little bit about this? Yeah, and that kind of maybe speaks to Jerry's point as well. So before I started doing the sound walks, before I did any of the sound walks, um, I co-facilitated a workshop at Central where I work um, with a Filipina um, a uh, theatre maker, community theatre maker, um, who'd recently relocated to the UK to work as a palli palliative care nurse. Um, and that that workshop was all about kind of um, the ethics of the project. It was about research ethics and we did it before I started the project kind of quite deliberately to include members of the Filipino diaspora in the UK um, into the design of the project. Um, and so we did kind of touch on those questions about risk and protection. But one of the things we talked about a lot was, um, was representation um, and kind of using, using performance-based exercises from forum theater, for example, improvisation, we kind of worked physically around um, the relationship between the researcher and the participant. Um, and thought about how to make that um, process of self-representation as equitable as we could. Um, and I think it was, it's hard to remember now exactly how, how I'd conceived of the project before that and how it changed kind of to, to pedal backwards in that sense. But I think a lot of, specifically the, the unstructured nature of those conversations, I think was a result one of the results of that of that workshop, um, because it was quite transformative in the project, um, and it was important. To, yeah, I learned a lot. I think from the participants and from the co-facilitator about about how to make that, yeah, how to to make that process of self-representation as as equitable as we could. Mm -hmm. Now, um, although Walk Listen Create uh, tries to be a compendium of um, um, uh, sound walks. Uh, we uh, clearly uh, are not yet because we missed uh, your previous work, uh, which is called Shadow Boxing. Yeah. Uh, which you did, uh, I don't know, four or five years ago, if I uh, remember correctly, uh, from what I saw. Um, and uh, what you, well, maybe you should tell it yourself, but uh, uh, I'll be quick, uh, where you interview a bunch of, uh, I think, Thai migrants in the United Kingdom practicing Thai boxing, right? Well, the interesting thing is, yeah, actually, they were not, none of them were Thai migrants. And that, so um, before I started doing these sound walks, I made a sound walk um, in Bethnal Green in East London with um, interviews of interviews with um, members of a Thai boxing academy based oh. in Bethnal Green, which is also a social care unit. So some of the people, including me, we were just going there for boxing training. Others were um, were referred to the academy by psychiatric nurses or probation officers. Um, and so it also operated as a kind of a form of social care. And, um, and what was interesting to me about that was the way that um, different people from different cultural and ethnic backgrounds related to Thai boxing. None of the people there were Thai most of them were Bangladeshi and Pakistani, which reflects the, the ethnic makeup of Tower Hamlets where the, the club was. Um, and so we, I made that um, for a, um, an issue of a kind of a, a magazine on, on transnational physical cultures. So it was really interesting to see the way that there was that, that this kind of culturally specific form of martial arts was being practiced by, for example, Bangladeshi immigrants in East London. Um, yeah, so that's what that, that project was about. And then did your methodolo methodology between um, this shadow boxing work and homemakers, uh, did your methodology change significantly? Yeah, I think shadow boxing was more structured in terms of the interviews. I had a, a more defined set of research questions before I started those interviews, um, whereas, 
the homemakers project is much more participatory it's much more collaborative um there was no co-editing in photo boxing um that's really something that i've developed in relation to, to this project and, and what it demands of a research process bearing in mind the people who are participating in it yeah yeah but that also must be much more intense right uh, for for the participants and for you uh, because as you say uh, somebody uh, you worked with uh, sat with you for 13 hours in creating their audio piece not in one go though, over several days <laughs> Can I just, yeah, um, <laughs> sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm back. <laughs> I'm quite interested in the relationship between um, the work and whether you see it as research or an expression of an art form. Because I see that the two are working together, but it seems that certainly in the last bits of your conversation, it's far more driven by the research side rather than the art form of sound walking. Yeah, I'm really tempted to, I don't know how many people here have, have, have had the chance to kind of explore the project, but I'm really tempted to turn that question back around because I think that that distinction is in the eye of the beholder in many ways. I'm working through those kind of different paradigms in terms of the process, but I'm more interested to hear how other people experience it, I suppose, whether whether it's a form of whether engaging the soundworks is a form of research for them, for you, or or whether it's an engagement in an artistic kind of genre of process. That that's really interesting to me. Yeah, no, I agree with you. And I've got an amazing book about researcher, curator, artist, what are you in, in this? And I think it's a very good question. It's sort of, the book asks all these questions about the fact that, you know, we straddle all these many roles, particularly as walking artists, as part of the walking artists network, using sound as walking. Um, there is that bit where it's walking as research, but there's also that bit of, as, you know, as an artistic expression. And it's trying to work out w which way this is going and, and why, and how you can actually um, combine the two. Does it really matter? Mm. I suppose it's what you're saying too. Yeah. And it's interesting to know what other people in the group think. Does it really matter? Yeah. Yeah, I, I was just going to say that, that I think that this kind of research and is it research, is it artwork, is a really um, it's setting up a, an opposition that, that isn't there. Um, and certainly the, um, you know, the Canadian stuff that I've read of research creation, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't have that opposition between doing research and making art. Um, and I feel, uh, Ella, that's very much there in your work, I really, really enjoyed it as, as, as a, you know, quite. It's not it, not my world, and I was able to, in the, in the way that sound that sound walk does, I was able to immerse myself in um, other people's worlds. Um, I was then able, in a sense, to sort of carry that story on and say to other people, "Gosh, have you seen this? Did you know this? Did you know? Did you know the other?" I was able to, um, I suppose. Some sharing of solidarity. I was able to admire the strength and the power of the voices that I heard. I think it's very, very powerful work, and it stands as that. Um, I think that that you know avoiding that kind of opposition between research and and uh, and, uh, and making art um, enables us to open up all kinds of uh, understand all kinds of other ways of knowledge generation that aren't bound up in that formal academic notion of doing research, you know, that it's, it's a, I don't know, kind of, it's not about extracting stuff, information yeah. it's from people to write academic reports. Um, it's about, I don't know, sharing understandings or finding new understandings of the world. And I think that this, um, that, that your, your piece, does that and, and I've shared it with other people on that basis so I just I just like to say you know solidarity both to you but also 
to the people whose voices that I've heard, and it's amazing that some of them here uh, this evening. It's it's, uh, it's brilliant stuff. Good on you. My question that I just sort of sneak in on the back of that is, I'm interested in you as a kind of a mediator in that process. Mm. How how does that you know how does that work out for you? Um, clearly, there's a social justice agenda in there for you, and and I wonder how you kind of you work that you know there must be some sort of when you you've got a really you know, strong interview and you think wow I've got to get I'll that 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 phrase has got to go in there how do you kind of you know or maybe you haven't had that experience but but you know that how do you work out your role as a sort of you know artist researcher in in there how do you roll yeah. that, that as a mediator is that what yeah it's interesting I I I've I'm thinking of moments where somebody said something and I've thought, wow, that really has to go in there. And um, they haven't wanted it in there, um, which is, I think, what you're, what you're kind of um, gesturing to. And that's, that's definitely happened. Um, and I think what's, maybe this is like a liberty that I have as a researcher because of the time scale that I'm working on. This is a three and a half year project. So I'm really lucky to have that kind of, that all that time to think through things is to go with that process and to say yeah okay that's this is your choice that's fine and then to be able to think about that later and think actually yeah I didn't get to have I didn't you know I didn't get my way with that what do I learn from that experience mm -hmm. to, to be able to kind of take that as a learning point rather than as something that's frustrating um so like to give you a really concrete example um I worked with a woman called Anne on a sound walk in Holland Park, um, which was a very emotionally loaded place for her because she experienced a lot of abuse from her employers. Um, and there were certain things she said when we were walking in Holland Park that were very shocking. Um, and they were the kind of things that I'd read in newspaper articles about migrant domestic workers' experiences. Um, um articles about modern slavery um and and trafficking and that kind of thing and i felt initially like some of those things should be in the sound walk because they captured the the kind of they created a very strong impact i thought on the listener and she didn't want them she didn't want them there and that's completely fine that's why we do the editing together because it's her choice um and then i've kind of recently thought about in in an article that i wrote recently kind of been thinking about what's at stake in those very spectacular narratives about modern slavery that we do hear in international media a lot um is that actually hiding something if if we're paying attention to very kind of sensational or spectacular accounts are we missing something about every day the everyday realities that migrant workers face the everyday abuses that they face the exploitation that isn't that isn't akin to modern slavery or that is it can't be described in those very spectacular terms they're just kind of everyday wearing down um and so yeah that was a that was a learning point it became from a frustration and potential frustration it became a learning point and I as a researcher was lucky to have I suppose the time that not all artists have to kind of sit back and think with that for, for, for a while yeah thank you though for your comments it really means a lot thank you hi Ella I have a question um hi. I was wondering um, how much are you consciously drawing from feminist methodologies in research? Because I hear, it, like, I see it in in your work, and I and what you're saying about the power relations between uh, researcher and research. Um, it's very much familiar to me in that sense, but uh, I don't know how much you're concretely drawing from that, and not only in the aspect of the research, but also because obviously you're dealing with reproductive labor. Yeah. And I was wondering how much are you looking into uh, feminist labor theories as well? Yeah, yeah, I'm really interested in um, particularly um, uh, there's a, a, a researcher, a peer called Julia Palladini, um, but uh, somebody 
who worked a lot with Italian histories of feminist thought, um, particularly Silvia Federici, who you probably know, who writes a lot about um, social reproduction. And I'm really, really interested in, in those things and to think about domestic work as part of a capitalist system that couldn't exist without social reproduction. Um, without social production being done either for free or in very exploitative conditions. So yeah, definitely situating that that work um, within those kind of material histories or historiographies. Um, in terms of the methodology, I have to be honest, I think that it came kind of quite quite organically through processes like the ethics workshop that we did or through kind of trial and error, you know, kind of working with people in different ways. And I think that the theory will maybe come later. Um, although I hear what you're saying about, for example, feminist participatory action research, and it definitely sits kind of quite close, quite close to that um, in different ways. So yeah, it's a conversation I'm kind of having with myself. So thanks for bringing it up. Um, where do you think Ella, uh, the work will go, homemakers? What do you what 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 are you, what are your plans, or how do you think it's positioned, and how will it be? How do you think it's going to be taken up? Or yeah, uh, it's a good question. For me, um, I'm kind of starting to write the the book now that will come out of that, um, and that's a really interesting process because it's very solitary. Um, it's very removed from the reality of doing the work. Um, and I think um, we all live in a very isolated time and I'm kind of feeling it, I think. But there's something quite productive, I suppose, about that, that solitude and thinking kind of critically in relation to, to what we did with the work. So that's the direction for me in one sense. Um, this kind of longer term process of thinking really carefully about kind of what happened and, what, and what, what's at stake, um, as well as some of the kind of theoretical frameworks that Georgia brought up. Um, and then in terms of the sound walks themselves, um, the site is there. I'm hoping to come back to it and to, to add more sound walks. There are more that have been recorded but got interrupted because of the pandemic that hopefully will um, will be uploaded when we're able to work together again um, or to find ways of working in isolation. Um, so that kind of continues to grow and we'll see what happens um, and we'll see what happens, you know, when, when other people, if other people take it up, um, like Sun and Walk September, for example, or yeah, other contexts. Well, your uh, homemakers, I think, is uh, getting quite a lot of traction with uh, um, recognitions and awards that it receives. If I read your news uh, page on the <laughs> side, well, so that's that's going well. At least you're getting the attention. Um, but related to uh, this uh, question as to where it will, where where do you think it will go, or where it might go, is um, um, you, you know, in the same article that I referred to earlier, the, the thing that you wrote uh, five years ago, right, with the Caipirinha reference, uh, is that you. <laughs> You say that um, uh, you said that there is no such thing as a one-way impact, right? Each yeah. impact has a counter result or results in a counter action. Yeah, am I saying this correctly? Um, each action has a, a, a counter action. Um, and um, so, what we maybe well, can you maybe talk a little bit about this? So what is the impact on on you or on your institution? How do you, have you seen impact? Uh, uh, be effectuated in the people that you interviewed? How has the work impacted um, the world around you? Mm. Yeah, good question. Um, I guess it's, I'll start with how the work has affected the people that I'm working with, um, because that's something that we kind of reflect on each time I make a sound walk, we always take some time afterwards to kind of talk about the process. Um, and one thing that really stuck with me that somebody said was that in listening to the sound walk, she kind of would put herself in the shoes of the listener and not the person that's telling the story. And that enabled her to have um, a certain kind of distance and to feel very proud of what she achieved. 
um, and she could hear herself from from an external perspective. You've you've survived this. You've done this. You've achieved this. You're you're at this process at this point in your life, um, and and she felt extremely proud of herself. And partly that was because she was at the point of editing. She she spent a really long time editing with me, and she got a really good grip of the software. And she was at a point in the editing where um she was adjusting the levels. She was kind of calibrating the levels between different parts of the sound walk, um, and she was she was really aware of how that would affect the listener the kind of really technical aspect of of the editing kind of gave her this um this sense of 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 achievement i suppose in terms of thinking about how she was affecting the listener and how um that made her kind of feel about her own story i think i've told that story kind of backwards a little bit but um that was a really touching kind of moment um in which the you know the really really technical kind of aspects of the creation had this effect on on her self perception um and others uh, i think well i think teresa spoke earlier about um about what what it means i suppose to her or what the what she wants to achieve through the sound um so i think she's kind of said that already um in terms of the impact for me it's a more difficult question because it's not something I get to reflect on very often, I suppose. Um, it's been my full-time work for over two years now. Um, and so the impacts are, are huge. They're, they're kind of everywhere um, in, in my working life and in my, in my personal life, I suppose, as well. Um, and I think at a time when people people began talking about the pandemic as a social equalizer, for example, um, as something that affects us all, that we're all in the same boat. I think a process like making this work really, really brings home how not in the same boat we are, um, how if um, sorry, um, kind of phenomena like like COVID actually reveal extremely stark inequalities. And I think that's become more and more, um, more and more, more visible um, throughout the, the process that we've been through in the UK recently. But I think that that was a real effect of the work. And I know one well, Marika is here who I've been collaborating with on another project, um, looking at uh, undocumented and irregular migrants in the UK and the impact of COVID on them and I think doing these two projects kind of in tandem and speaking to undocumented migrants in the UK really really hugely impacted my experience of the pandemic and what's been happening in recent months and maybe Mariko you can you can empathize with that I don't know but um the impact's been been very uh, very profound, I suppose, in terms of how I relate to 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 the question of social inequality. Yeah, um, yeah. Thank you for um, inviting me to this as well. Um, yes, um, I worked with Ella on this research on undocumented mig Filipino migrants in the UK during pandemic, and we started it because we heard of the really really sad story of a um, undocumented migrant who sadly died at his home because she was afraid of well he had a COVID symptoms and he was too scared of of calling to NHS or even yeah dropping off by um, the clinic because because he didn't have paper and yeah his wife also suffered from symptoms but she was also too scared of going to you know seek um, help so that's that's when we kind of really started to look at what's really happening to the people uh, with our papers in the UK. And with Ella, we, we surveyed and we heard stories from almost 100 people. Um, Ella interviewed people in depth as well. And it's it's really showed a lot of inequality, as a, as, especially with undocumented people who are in informal contract. Um, day one of lockdown, lost work, and they have, of course, no uh, access to public funds and it's really really um it's, it's just so difficult situations and how 
Although I also want to emphasize here that how the migrant communities has been supporting each other when there's no um, support from you know, the, the system as well. So it's been really um, yeah, such an experience and such a difficult time for, for our communities. But um, I think sort of, yeah, hearing from them, Ella spent so many, so much time um, talking to these individuals. And also, I think some people find it very revealing to be able to share their stories because they've been living so many years just hiding and not mentioning their issues. And, and that's also um, difficult. So yeah, that was the that was the work we did together. And also, I just want to say that from what I, I heard earlier, Amela, that uh, you worked on, on sound work and some of the your participants um, participated in the editing process as well. And I think it's really, it's really um, interesting to hear. And I think it's very important. One of the work that we did was we tried to kind of um, empower migrants, or well, not empower, but sort of trying to, to help uh, people how to speak their stories, especially like we work with some journalists who have uh, some, yeah, who's been trying to focus on the feature, the stories of experience of migrant workers on the undocumented people. But as much as we kind of, we try to tell the stories, the editing process is in their hand. And it's always, uh, it's not always sort of the stories are, that mm -hmm. is most important for people, it's not hard. So I, I thought that was really interesting that you worked on the editing process as well. What is your intention with the interviews that, uh, that you've done? Uh, are, you, what, are you gonna make it into a compendium of interviews or is it going to be a sound walk as well? Or what is your objective here? The interviews that we did with Mariko, um, with undocumented Filipinos, are um, they informed a report that was published in June, um, which was much more kind of social. I found I found it very social sciencey to write. Um, I had to kind of stick to specific ways of writing for policymakers and and um, and journalists, and I was. It wasn't the way I usually work, but it was really important to kind of to to target policy change, basically. Um, which I don't know if there are other researchers here who've had to kind of negotiate those um, different audiences or different ways of working. Um, but that's what that's what that was for. So there was a report that we published in June called "A Chance for Field Say," um, which looked yeah. Could you repeat that? Sorry. A chance to feel safe. Um, yeah, which is published by Kanlunga Filipino Consortium. I'd like to say to Ella that I think what she's done is amazing. A really amazing piece of work. I really do. I mean, I grew up in Peru, Bolivia. Um, I have knowledge of people who worked in my family's house, who grew up, who were born in my family's house, who then they weren't maltreated, but there was a very unequal relationship. Mm. And it's, um, it's something that's very hard to watch. And I think empowering people to tell their stories is really, really important. Um, I think I, I've mentioned it before at some of the cafes. There's a um, Kipu Telefonico in South America. The Kipu Telefonico is a, a phone line where people can phone up and tell their stories about being um, sterilized during Fujimoto um, presidency of Peru, where they decided that it was time to uh, curtail indigenous babies and the growth in population. And women were told, uh, having given birth to one child, that it was a good idea and they weren't really given much choice. And the Kipu Telefonico is a line where people can phone up and tell their stories. And I think the telling of stories for people who feel powerless is enormously important. And um, I find it very distressing, actually. I think it's incredibly distressing. And, I, and I'm listening to you and I admire what you do. And I just wonder how on earth you protect yourself as well because you there is an emotional involvement you you get to know people yeah it's hard 
yeah yeah um thank you so much for sharing that it's, yeah really moving to hear that perspective um and i think that i suppose one of the that i think i do agree with you that telling your story and being heard is a very therapeutic process and an empowering process to some extent um and i'm i'm always cautious i suppose when talking about the work in those terms because i don't want to over explain um or to use those kind of humanitarian words of i'm i'm empowering women or i'm you know I'm giving a voice or that kind of thing because I don't I don't think the work does that for everybody or can do that for everybody. Um, but you can yeah hear in some of the sound books that that it is a very to some extent a transformative experience. And coming from a theatre background, obviously I'm you know a definite advocate for, for telling stories as a, as a kind of fundamental thing that we do together. Um, and that has really transformative powers. Um, yeah, does that, I don't know what kind of response to your question that is, but thank you again for, for sharing that, it's really touching. Just, just to go on from that, um, yeah, I'd also like to say how much I've enjoyed listening to you. Um, I, I do a project where I walk with people and they take me on walks that are important for them. So we kind of, we start in a similar place really. But just reflecting on my experience, you know, I was walking once with a Senegalese street trader in Florence um, and just recording our conversations and just observing the amount of casual racism towards him um, and trying to consider how I should respond or if I should respond and what my role is mm -hmm. there because basically it's his story, you know, and I don't have the right really to jump in and <laughs> shout at these people much as I would have liked to. And that, that sort of, you know, that role of being kind of neutral, but not really neutral is, I find quite a hard one sometimes. I just wondered, you know, yeah. that's it really. <laughs> well, I can appreciate how, yeah, how hard that must have been. Um, and it's interesting, I think was it Babak who who kind of used the term mediator earlier. Um, it's interesting that you do, as a researcher or an artist working with different communities, get placed in the role of being a mediator. Um, and it's one that I'm really not comfortable with most of the time because mm. you end up speaking for people instead of speaking with them. Um, and it's why I think it's really. Um, great to have members of the alliance here with us today although it's not always easy to have a conversation with the technology that's available to us um because yeah because i i i really struggle with that that role the mediator and i don't i don't really want to be speaking about people's experience or speaking for them um yeah, so that is really it is really difficult. You're not neutral. You're not neutral. Mm -hmm. You're never neutral. Um, and I think that research disciplines playing some kind of neutrality or objectivity are um, just really really misleading. <laughs> um, yeah, so that I suppose is another thing that that the arts can teach research again is about non neutrality and humility. I think of, of non neutrality, um, which isn't always respected by social science disciplines, for example, or others. Um, you worked uh, with, in Homemakers with uh, Filipino migrant, domestic migrant workers, and with the project that you're currently working on, uh, or have worked on uh, that you mentioned, um, uh, is also focusing on Filip or migrant workers, at least in the UK, and the effect of COVID-19. Um, but you see, you have also some prior experience in with working in Southeast Asia or doing research in South, Southeast Asia. Yeah. Um, and uh, in one article that you wrote about this, uh, you referred to uh, how traveling can be a method for research, right? Um, which is, uh, you know, Billy also uh, talked about, uh, uh, you referred to the term wayfaring as a way to uh, discover, uh, well, yourself, I suppose, or you know, to uncover uh, certain truths. Um, and you also mentioned a, a wonderful quote 
uh, that was mentioned by, I think, I think you said that the, uh, I might get it wrong, the president of Indonesia, he says uh, the, the, the sea is a highway, but he refers to the um, um, journey from island to island in the archipelago in uh, Southeast Asia, right? And now where I'm going is the name that is sometimes used to describe this is, as you know, Nusantara. And literally this means, um, as you write, uh, in between islands or in between islands, in between islands, in between islands. Now, what I would like to know, and you see this has moved away a little bit from homemakers, uh, is would you say this is about um, the islands or about space between the islands? <laughs> Uh, yeah, really interesting question. I noticed Mariko is nodding because I know she's a fluent um, Bahasa Indonesian speaker. <laughs> so I'm, um, yeah, I'm a bit on the spot. But yes, you're right. I did my PhD. Um, I graduated, my PhD was um, graduated from the National University of Singapore as well as King's College London. So it was a um, jointly funded PhD, and I spent um, about a year living in Singapore and travelling quite a lot in Southeast Asia, um, including the Philippines during that time. And um, refers to both the islands themselves and the space between the islands, but can also refer in kind of a cosmological sense to spaces between um, different um, spiritual or cosmological realms. Um, but it's also a term that's been kind of co-opted um, to by certain uh, kind of nas nationalist or national frameworks um, in Southeast Asia and Indonesia specifically. I don't know enough to talk about that at length, but what it did offer in, that, in, in the scope of that article, for example, and a lot of my thinking around travel was this idea that as researchers, we're not, we often use the term field work to describe what we do. And that kind of um that metaphor of the field suggests that we're working in a kind of cleared out clearly demarcated or boundary space a flat ground where we can do our work and that's not the case at all we don't just parachute into a field and do the work there's always a way that we come and there are the mobilities of the people who are also entering and exiting that space and i think that kind of conceiving of research as wayfaring or as a process of journeying is a much more helpful way of understanding the kind of sometimes transient nature of our relationships of the relationships that we form and i think in my research tra tra i say transient but also i don't mean I think I don't mean to equate transience with superficiality and I think that's what's really helpful about this that wayfaring is about um, mobility but it's not about um, a kind of superficial moving between um, it's about sustaining yourself and sustaining others through that process of moving um, and I'm sure other people here know a lot more about it than me so I'll stop there but um, I think that conceiving of research as a mode of as a mode of journeying um, in in my context, both as the, the walking of the sound walking, um, which is a process that takes place over a period of time through an embodied kind of movement through a certain physical proximity to somebody. Um, but also the way that I'm moving between the UK, the, Le the UK, Lebanon, and what would have been the Philippines if not for COVID. Um, informs again the inequalities that exist between me and the, the people I'm working with who are mobile in very, very different ways and migrate in very different ways. Um, but is a kind of productive way of thinking about um, the way that those relationships um, kind of evolve and move differently. I think I would like to add to this is one thing that I realized about the term Nusantara, if it means, if it focuses on the spaces between the islands, um, which ties in with the quote from this president, whatever prime minister saying that the sea is a highway, um, is that the people that you interviewed uh, for homemakers and also the people that you interviewed for your more recent project on the effects of COVID-19, these people are migrants, right? And they are un in many cases undocumented migrants. So they always occupy the spaces in between. 
they their home is not or rather other people don't think that their home is the uk other people don't think that their home is lebanon they exist between these worlds they're not lebanese they're filipino or they're I, I, uh, ivorian they're not british they're also migrants there um but they do the, the spaces in between for people like this is is not the spaces in between it's their own world um the rest is the space in between mm -hmm. anyway it's like a because news on Tara becomes then like a flipping of this this uh, term i mean is it you know what is in between what is home mm. anyway that's a really um, interesting yeah way of thinking about it that i hadn't that i hadn't thought of at all once you're a migrant you're never at home right you're yeah. always in between idea of migration in some places like places like philippines indonesia sort of malay world it's kind of it's, it's very i don't know it's 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 always there like it is not kind of border control that has kind of you know we see today in the uk for example like in the history is kind of the way people are mixing together in the sea and sort of the sea has been home for some and i think kind of yeah that that's that's kind of what the santara is and also kind of archipelago, archipelago on the southeast asia all the way up to Taiwan and Okinawa and Japan, where I come from, it's very kind of, yeah, it's it's very diverse and very kind of mixed together as well. Yeah, yeah. I think that I wrote that article while I was in the Philippines in Mindanao, actually, and which is a, a large island in the south of the Philippines, um, in part partly in response to meeting people from the Bajau um, indigenous group who are actually sea nomads. Um, so make their living from the sea and don't have kind of fixed residences on land, um, traditionally speaking, at least. Um, and I think what Mariko is saying about a kind of that archipelagic space as one that is always in motion. Um, that's that's and and very very much so in the Philippines, which is both an archipelago in itself and has a very very long generations long tradition of out migration and labor, labor migration. Um, and so I think, again, to come back to the kind of misleading nature of this term field work, you don't do field work when it comes to the Philippines. You're always engaging in cultures of mobility and you're always engaging in a kind of um, historical context in which, um, and I say historical not to mean in the past, but you know, to position our moment within a history in which mobility and movement and migration have been so central to so many people's everyday lives for a really, really long time. Um, so that, yeah, that's one of the reasons why that focus on movement, I think, is, is important. Um, thank you. Uh, I, we've been busy for an hour and a half. Um, uh, which is a decent amount of time um we could go on uh, how many you know have you got another five hours ella <laughs> <laughs> but maybe for another time uh is there anyone who wants to add something to uh, to what we've been discussing today hi uh it's miriam Elina. um i just want to congratulate uh, ella for the uh, job well done. It's very interesting and uh, thank you so much that we are part of it. Oh, Lena, thank you. Thank you so much. And thanks for sticking with the conversation. I know it's getting really late, but I really appreciate you being here. And that's really um, means a lot for you to say that. Thank you. Yeah, and I refer that uh, um, and I, what Lina said, but I also reflect what uh, Ella said. Uh, I mean, Ella's work would not be possible without Ella, but it would also not be possible without the people that she interviewed, including uh, uh, Lina and um, uh, Julia and Delphine, and who have been, and Teresa, I think, who've been on the call with us, as well as uh, the other uh, people that she interviewed for her work. Um, so, well, with that, then I would like to wrap up. I will thank you again, Ella. I think it has been fantastic. Uh, I thought it was extremely great. Maybe there's something that you want to close with, Ella? No, just to say thank you again to, to all of you who could be here and especially to Julia, Lena and Delphine and Teresa for tuning in from Beirut in a different time zone after a long working day. 
So thank you so much and to everyone and also to um, to Babek for hosting and to Andrew as well for um, for providing this opportunity to discuss. It's been really lovely to have your, your questions and thoughts. Um, I'm very, very privileged. Thank you. Our utmost pleasure. So uh, thanks for stopping by and uh, hopefully uh, see you all and all your friends in uh, two weeks time at the next cafe.